Great. Well, well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for thanks for joining in. I uh, really have enjoyed uh, hearing from Ray and Michelle uh, this morning here in the in the states, and uh, lots of exciting things going on. And uh, Kate and I are excited today to uh, share uh, this Actigraph and VivaSense case study on uh, collaborating on developing novel novel digital biomarkers. And uh, I think uh, hopefully you guys will enjoy uh, what we're going to present today. Uh, very short presentation, just 20 minutes. We want to leave room for some discussion at the end, but really just want to speak through um, making the case for real-time, real-world data and discussing the development of this new digital biomarker that uh, VivoSense and I had and Matt Graff been working on uh, called the Best Six-Minute Effort. And we're going to talk a little bit about the data behind that, and kind of the next steps of where we're heading. So to start us off, I, I thought it might be helpful to just remind ourselves what a clinically meaningful endpoint uh, is. Uh, it's a measure of a meaningful aspect of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And so I would just ask the question, you know, are, are we really capturing these uh, effectively with static in-clinic measures? Um, in particular, do we understand the entire picture of how a patient feels and functions by checking on them twice a year? or even five times a year. And it's, this is not a new concept for the Digital Biomarker Summit. Uh, of course, Ray has been a great advocate of highlighting the challenges of what we're trying to accomplish here. So as we look at this in-clinic versus real-world measurement, um, maybe we can think through you know, the risk of, of doing this improperly. So I think the primary goal of late-stage clinical uh, efficacy trials uh, like trials that are like an investigational drugs or behavioral intervention, just to really test whether uh, the treatment has a has has like a beneficial impact on the on the health of the patient. And I think sometimes we observe that those those trials fail because of lack of treatment benefit. But what if what if we're just not observing the treatment benefit? Um, of course, there there are instances where the treatment benefit is not beneficial, and and the trial should fail. But there are other times when the treatment is beneficial. Uh, but the treatment benefit is not adequately translated to the specified study endpoint. And so the hypothesis of what we want to talk about today is this idea that digital tools can provide us with this uh, other dimension, uh, this other aspect uh, of visibility and, and the health that has not traditionally been captured by, uh, by traditional in-clinic measurements. And of course, I shamelessly, uh, well, I want to mention that ultimately patients are at stake here. So um, I, th I think we tend to forget that. We get so hung up in the endpoint. We get, we get really hung up in what we're talking about uh, around the concept of measuring a digital endpoint that we forget that if we get this wrong, uh, patients are ultimately at stake. And so we, we owe it to ourselves and to the industry to really push forward um, around these hypotheses. Uh, I sort of shamelessly stole a slide from Ray Dorsey here, and I told him that I was going to do so, but uh, this is uh, a great illustration of, of the what, why, and how uh, of what we're talking about here in this example of Parkinson's as a therapeutic area. Um, it, traditionally, as Ray has already mentioned, and I didn't know that he would do that this morning, we had these traditional uh, in-clinic measurements, and he's referred to these as, as uh, sort of the gold standard, but they're pretty crude. Um, and we believe that most of what happens uh, in a patient's life happens outside the confines of the clinic. They happen in their home. They happen in their work. And so with new digital endpoints, we have the ability now to have visibility into these other areas uh, of, of where behavior actually occurs. And so we believe that if we can get this right, if, if we can uh, define and understand better what we're trying to accomplish and capture uh, we might have better visibility into, as I've said, the, the treatment benefit of what we're what we're trying to help there. Uh, Christian, I took this slide out right off Roche's website, and uh, this is just illustrating this comprehensive view of the patient. And the idea behind this is, you know, there are 365 days in a year, and a patient might see, um, might be in the clinic two of those days, and when they're asked about how they're feeling, their recall period might only be uh, a, a few days back, maybe seven or eight days. Um, but in fact, someone who's living with a disease uh, has good days and they have bad days. And, you know, as we look at our hypothesis around digital tools being able to give new information, it's certainly clear in this picture that it's much more informative if we have that holistic view. And so down the path of looking at a continuous real world 
measurement. Let me just use for an example an accelerometer measurement for obvious reasons. I mean, ActiGraph uh, uses and sells accelerometer products, but we really believe that there's quite a bit of opportunity for, for benefits here. So we can envision a number of applications where continuous time measurement might provide us visibility into how we might improve dosing for symptom management. Uh, if, if we have that picture that we just looked at and we can think through how might dosing help uh, critical times of that patient's life, well, that's going to inform us better. It can also help us with trends and we can respond a little more, a, a lot quicker than we could in the past if we're looking at this thing in real time. Um, the other important thing that we don't talk about a whole lot is the ability to add contextual information and really get a better holistic picture of the patient's life. So I don't want to pretend that one sensor is going to save the world. I think it's important that we say, can we combine a sensor modality with an EPRO report, for instance, to give us some visibility into that patient's life and how they're actually feeling and functioning and surviving um, rather than just asking them twice a year. And then finally, um, again, to the, to the point of having more sensors, this idea of combining uh, objective data with not only uh, activity sensors, but also physiological sensors like heart rate and respiratory. So um, some great, great examples here of how we might envision uh, applying the technology. So as we look at, at how you develop an endpoint, um, we actually adapted this, uh, this drawing that I'm going to put on the screen from uh, the ISPOR's Clinical Outcome Assessment Research Task Force. They have a great framework for COA. And it really applies well to the development of the endpoints that we're going to talk about today. So if we follow the principle that we always state at ActiGraph, and that is begin with the end in mind, we have to first identify the specific activities that are meaningful to our patient population. So, for example, a patient population that suffers from reduced or diminished physical function might report that they'd like to be able to perform ambulatory activities, such as you know walking a dog or um, riding the bus to work or going shopping or whatever it might be. If we start there, those are meaningful to the patient and that's where we need to begin. And then from there, once we've identified that, we work backward to identify the meaningful aspects of health that these activities reflect. And from there, we can better understand what's the concept we're trying to measure that is related to that meaningful aspect of health. And then how do we measure that? Or how do we formulate or define our endpoint so that we're not only looking at um, it, it just the meaningful aspect of health in general, but specifically what measure can give us that answer. So in this example, you can see that we're talking about the six minute walk test. And this is a pretty popular clinic measurement that gives us some good insight into walking capacity or physical function. Um, but out of that, we've got, we've got to think through what are those endpoint properties? Um, what are we trying to measure? What are we trying to get at? And so I think the six minute walk test is a pretty popular outcome assessment but it's a good example of an assessment that can be augmented or supplemented with real world data collected from a wearable sensor. And so that's what we've worked with VivoSense to develop. And so this slide is entitled Digital Endpoint Development. It follows the same process, but you can see that the, the difference here is, is that we replaced it with this best, best six minute effort. And so this is a, <clears throat> a novel assessment derived from real world data and we're developing this currently. Um, but it's defined using a, a sliding window on continuous accelerometer data to identify the peak six minute window of stepping activity for every day the device is worn. And so the idea here is that by changing the assessment tool, we alter some of the endpoint properties in a way that allows for deeper and more insightful assessment of the patient's health. And so to talk a little bit further about how that actual endpoint was developed, I'm going to hand it off to Kate Lydon at VivoSense, and she's going to walk you guys through kind of a comparison of the six-minute walk test versus the best six-minute effort and the differences between those two and how we got how, what we're working through from a validation verification uh, pathway. Kate? Thanks, Jeremy, and good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, so as Jeremy mentioned for the second half of this presentation, I'm going to um, take a little bit of time to familiarize um, everyone a little bit more with this joint project between ActiGraph and VivoSense to develop um, the best six minute effort uh, endpoint or B6ME as we like to call it. 
So in this uh, slide, what we have here is a side-by-side -side comparison of B6ME to the six-minute walk test. And the idea is that B6ME captures a similar concept to the six-minute walk test, um, but in our minds, we've enhanced this um, because we're now able to measure outcome results continuously in a real-world setting. Um, and, and so because we're able to use an objective tool to do that, continuously, every day the person wears the device, we're also able to derive um, uh, so, so some measures that are related to distance walk as measured by the six minute walk test, but that aren't easily measured in a clinic setting. So other things that we can derive using this type of assessment are the number of steps that are taken within that peak six minute window that's identified, the cadence or the intensity of that stepping um, that occurs during that peak window, the duration of stepping, so it may be that the patient doesn't walk for the full continuous uh, six minutes, um, which, which you can imagine a lot of people actually don't within a 24-hour day. They don't walk for the full for continuously for six minutes, so this is important. We're also able to look at the timing of the event, so um, does this peak window occur at a similar time every day for uh, one patient, or does it happen sporadically throughout the day, and what does that mean for um, the, the disease manifestation for that patient. Is it related to when they're taking their medicine? That sort of um, thing. And then also, I'd just like to point out, I don't have them on this slide here, but um, we're also, you can also derive, uh, you know, more detailed measures of gait, such as stride velocity and stride length and those sorts of things. Go ahead, Jeremy. So um, when we were planning this presentation, we had some grand plans to present some really interesting data regarding the development and validation of this new uh, B6ME endpoint. Um, but COVID-19 obviously had different plans for us and for the world. So instead, I'm presenting you a um, proof of concept uh, study, as I'll call it, um, where we uh, uh, drive this endpoint on three healthy individuals who wore the Actograph um, Center Point Insight Watch for 30 continuous days. Um, and I have there on the slide again, those measures that were derived. So number of steps taken within that peak window that's identified, cadence, duration of walking and timing of the event. So these data here, um, show the number of steps taken within the identified best six minute window for each day of the measurement for each of the three subjects. So each of the three subjects are on those horizontal lines there. Um, the pink colored bars indicate instances where the uh, peak six minute window was not a continuous walk. So the person didn't walk for six continuous minutes um, during that 24 hour period. And you can imagine that that's an important thing to be able to tease out of this because if somebody only took, you know, for example, um, 300 versus 700 steps during that peak window, but they didn't walk continuously, we, we want to know that. Um, and so go ahead, Jeremy. So what I've added here in these black dots is the cadence or the intensity of the steps that occurred um, during that window. So it's just another piece that we can pull out. And then on the right side here, we have the five-day moving averages um, of these uh, measures, which allows us, as Jeremy alluded to previously, to evaluate the trends in the data. So you can imagine that for a clinical group, uh, this may be really important for understanding the course of disease um, or the, you know, just the progression of the disease uh, over time. So, I'm not gonna um, <laughs> pretend like those were the most particularly exciting or insightful data on these three um, healthy patients. But um, as I said before, we did, we did have some really big plans for this B6ME endpoint uh, starting this winter and spring. Um, and and before, we, before COVID-19, we were um, following this framework of the V3 model um, for validating and developing this endpoint, this, this publication that we here, have here on the screen um, is a really great uh, recent publication that um, presents a, a systematic approach to this three-phase model for validating um, uh, your, your digital tools um, to be used in a digital endpoint. 
Um, and so we were following this process, um, specifically the, the final two steps here, which are analytical validation and clinical validation. So I'm just gonna share with you a little bit of what we had planned, which we hope to get started again as soon as possible. So the first step um, that we have here is analytical validation. So analytical validation um, is, um, seeks to answer the question, are the output variables produced by my wearable accelerometer and data processing procedures accurate, reliable, um, as compared to criterion values? So back in the very beginning of March, we actually received IRB approval to move forward with this step of bringing in um, human subjects to a motion capture lab, as well as to a real world living science lab to validate this B6 ME endpoint um, as compared to criterion values. So in the motion capture lab, we were looking at stride length, velocity, stride asymmetries, those sorts of things. Um, and then um, of course, this is quite a structured environment where uh, participant patients movements are quite controlled. So we um, had another step in this um, process to bring them into a much more real world setting um, and click criterion values using video cameras, um, either by following the participant around in their uh, real world environment, or we also have a, a living science lab that we're gonna do this in where the you can see the kind of simulated apartment there on the right where a patient, I don't wanna say lives, but exists in this space for you know hours at a time and we capture their movements using video cameras and then use those as criterion values. Um, and so because analytical validation is on hold, um, the clinical validation piece of this um, was also on hold. And so clinical validation seeks to answer the question, do the output variables produced by my wearable accelerometer and data processing procedures represent a meaningful aspect of health in my specific patient population? Um, so for this <clears throat> piece of validation, we um, were, the, the plan was, you know, a lot of people have collected ActiGraph data over the years and they've collected the raw sensor signal. And so, you know, that's really important. You know, we say how important that is all the time. And in this, this particular instance, it's a great example of how we can go back to these um, regulated drug trials that have used ActiGraph to collect raw sensor data um, and derive this new endpoint, the B6ME, from the sensor data and look at how they're related to other um, accepted endpoints that were also um, collected in those trials. And so, we have a lot of uh, study studies to pull from to do this, um, but at the moment, without the analytical validation, it doesn't make much sense to move forward with that at the moment. So that's a little bit on hold too. But some of the examples of what we're trying to do here is we want to look at how do the how do the measures derived um, within that peak window um, relate to distance walk as measured by the six minute walk test in a clinic setting. And how does the B6ME measures relate to other hard clinical endpoints in these trials? Um, we, we really, you know, obviously want to understand how these measures from B6ME reflect walking capacity um, or physical functioning and physical functioning in specific clinical groups. Um, and of course, the context of these are specific. So we're seeking to do this in as many clinical populations as possible. Um, we need to understand what's clinically me meaningful for each group. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, how do, how, how do we, you know, um, uh, uh, understand, you know, what is a meaningful change for, for each group? Um, we are collecting these measures daily, as mentioned, and this, this we think is a really valuable piece of why we use digital tools in a real world environment, but how do we understand the variance within a person? Um, how do we look at trends and understand the course of the disease? What are the statistical tools that we use to do this? Um, so all of this would be part of the clinical validation. <coughs> Excuse me. Excellent. Um, Kate, just want to remind you that you are running already out of time. So. Okay, sure. Um, so so um, the last point here is that um, you know this requires a lot of supportive evidence. So if, if you've collected ActiGraph data in the past in your trial and you'd like um, to help us out with this, then certainly reach out. We'd be excited to talk to you. Um, and I'm just wrapping it up here. Um, final thoughts, you know, real world data is messy, but we think it's worth it. This 
mess of a squiggle here is real world data, but when we add context um, on a daily um, basis, we think that what you get out is um, really quite worth it. So I'll end it there. Very good. Thank you, thank you Kate. Um, maybe maybe just one quick question um, uh, and that is more a holistic one uh, to both of you uh, is there anything that farmer companies can do better uh, to to work jointly with you vendors um, um, on the development of such digital endpoints Jeremy I know you're dying to answer that Maybe not. Um, hey, sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah, I'll just chime in there. Thank you, Christian. Um, I, yes, <laughs> I think when we've seen we've seen we've seen sponsors that have been willing to share their data uh, to to really help evolve the development of some of these endpoints. And in fact, I have to grab some discussions with three groups right now on this particular endpoint. And so it's helpful when at the beginning of the protocol planning. Um, there's this idea that, hey, we're, we're going to actually use this data to help evolve uh, some endpoints in a pre competitive fashion. And then also um, just helping us plan ahead for the protocol. As I've said a number of times, what we don't want is, you know, to get a call that we're going to implement any type of wearable technology or any type of technology in the study, remote study, you know, when we're like six weeks from starting the study, it helps us to have a good runway to get this going. And so just helping us understand and others understand, you know, can we plan ahead for this and get all the teams involved? So. Okay, good. And we can elaborate a little bit more on uh, during the panel on on this for the outlook. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. Um, thank you both, Kate and uh, and Jeremy, for this nice presentation. And um, full fully understand the uh, the challenges that you were facing with COVID. So keeping my fingers crossed for the continuation of of that uh, validation that you are working on there. Thank you, Richard. Our